Good evening to all of you. So I, this is, a, I guess, at least the second time I've spoken to this forum. The previous one was a breakfast, and now we've raised the standard to dinner. The, and what I'd like to offer some brief thoughts about is how I see uh, the intersection between the high-scale computing environment that has emerged out of the Internet and how I think that may relate to some of the challenges that we face in uh, certainly the high-income countries with respect to the evolution of our healthcare system and how that will play a role in uh, hopefully both improving outcomes, lowering cost, uh, and enabling new research, and in particular the evolution to a more completely data-driven model of, of uh, health care and medicine. Uh, when I look back at you know, our own evolution, I'll say in Microsoft and as part of the, the Internet uh, industry at large, one of the things that, that that has brought about is the requirement for the development of a new class of computing facilities that you know, you, I euphemistically call super scale computing. Uh, it's a bit like you know going down to the hamburger store now and saying you know I, I want my hamburger but now I want it supersized, and you know in some sense people think oh I know what that means it just means that I put together more of the computers that we've always built, but in fact in our evolution we found that that didn't work, that there turns out to be a qualitative difference in complexity in building and operating computing facilities at the scale of let's say, you know, thousands or ten thousands of machines and building one that operates at a scale of hundred thousands or millions of machines. And, uh, you know, everything gets more complicated. So having uh, stubbed our toe a little bit in trying to figure out how to build these things out of traditional enterprise technology, uh, we set about to really re-architect them quite completely. And, you know, as that went on, uh, as uh, was the case in other companies like Google and Amazon and, and uh, Yahoo and eBay, you know, each was developing a technology that was well suited to their particular uh, task. But a byproduct of all of them was a realization that the traditional model of computing wasn't going to work very well uh, when you tried to scale it up to that level. And so the world today that everybody uh, calls the cloud is really just a name that's been applied uh, to, in my mind, to the development of these technologies uh, that operate at, at a very, very high scale and are generally accessible through the network. The, the cloud and how the internet technologies around it have been built up, for me, has been informative when I uh, was sort of brought to the task of looking more specifically at the question of the evolution of the healthcare environment, uh, particularly in the United States, and, uh, and was asked to participate in a group that would think about how a more radical infusion of these kind of technologies might uh, be transformative within the healthcare domain. And uh, two years ago, I was appointed by President Obama to his Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And one of the first things that he asked that group to do was, in fact, to look precisely at that problem. Uh, even though the health care legislation passed last year was not well defined at the time, I think the President knew uh, that it was more likely the case that, that the legislation would focus a lot on the question of expanding access in the United States and that we would still be left with a set of challenges downstream related to improving quality and, of course, ultimately lowering cost. I think the U.S. this year is getting to, I think, 17 point five or six percent of GDP is invested in the healthcare enterprise and you know it's pretty clear that that's not sustainable you know even if everything else was rosy relative to the economic climate uh, but during this same period it's been clear that the US and the rest of the world are going through a significant upheaval uh, and that these pose you know significant challenges going forward but nonetheless uh, you know we formed a, a, a panel of people to work on that and, you know, it was quite interesting because we assembled uh, not only people who were traditionally involved in, in the medical informatics domain, but we brought both economists and technologists in 
who were from, I'll say, more uh, the internet high scale computing environment. And as we essentially collided these two groups uh, and, and sort of watched the particles come out, you know, what it began to, to tell us was that there was uh, at least an opportunity to look at a more radical way of thinking about how to bring uh, all of the world's health information together and to do it in a way that was, on one hand, less disruptive uh, than, than might be thought uh, historically to the traditional approaches, and on the other hand, would allow us to integrate data at a scale that had not been achieved in the past, and notably to also overcome one of the historical problems, which was the, the view uh, uh, of the impact on privacy related to the health records. You know, privacy is a big concern, uh, especially in Europe over the decades, and, and the, uh, the assembly of huge amounts of data on the Internet has raised this question of privacy to a new level, uh, not only in Europe, but uh, certainly in the United States and other countries. And of course, no matter what domain you choose to operate in, there's a general agreement that you know, if you want to get people the most charged up around the question, just talk about privacy as it relates to healthcare information. And so, you know, the subgroup in this case took a, a significant uh, amount of time to contemplate whether there was, in fact, a technological way to enhance privacy, as opposed to sort of stick at the level most people uh, were, were thinking and, and were afraid of, which was just as we tended to pool or aggregate the data, it was sort of inevitable that we would undermine privacy. And my view, you know, in this domain and others is that, in fact, uh, the evolution of technology, the, the, the incredible capacities that we have, both in computation and storage, uh, create an environment where there is the prospect of, uh, of, of organizing uh, the world's health information. Uh, and to do that for both the domain of, of the enterprise of health and, and also ultimately for uh, the domain or the incorporation of consumer uh, health-related information, which I think will include both the traditional concept of medical uh, data, but will also increasingly have data focused on health and wellness. And so we really need to see the emergence of uh, two platforms, one that will support the the consumer engagement and the ecosystem that must build up around that over time, and one that will essentially uh, think about how to, to bring all of the data assets that have emerged from the advances in diagnostic equipment uh, and the, the general uh, utilization of computing within the practice of medicine and use it to create a platform that will catapult the health side of the business forward, not just in terms of operational efficiencies, but ultimately to uh, facilitate the transition from, I'll say, that, you know, the, the traditional uh, forms of medicine and the practice around it to a more data-driven form of medicine where we'll see even greater amounts of data through genomics and proteomics uh, and other uh, increasingly advanced you know, sensing and diagnostic systems. All of these things will create an environment where uh, or I think we want to see the emergence of more of a market, you know, you could say in, in the sense more like, you know, how do we create a situation much like you see in, in the mobile phone space or others where you have a lot of people who are being able to contribute things uh, in, in terms of software and applications and analytics and that, that, that just becomes a much broader space in which uh, people can come and, and, and forward, whether from an academic point of view or from a commercial point of view. And, uh, to do that, we, we have to you know, just create a, a lot more liquidity in the data that's already out there. Of course, this has been a challenge, and for 20 years, you know, the healthcare community uh, has largely been following a, a fairly uh, constant, or I'll say at least slowly evolving strategy that you know, was, was rooted in the idea of establishing a common electronic medical record and that that would become the basis of exchange uh, and, and the basis of uh, building some kind of uh, more interchangeable or common workflow or interpretation capability over time. And, you know, I think 20 odd years ago, that was probably a, a great way to start. It was the way that the world thought about information technology at the time. 
but you know, in the, in the intervening time, the internet's gone from sort of non-existent to an integral part of everybody's life, and and with it, it forced uh, I'll say the, the rest of the IT community, as many of you would know, uh, to to contemplate a world where you're trying to collect and organize and, and share and allow applications to be built on top of a incredibly diverse and very, very large scale set of data that was rapidly evolving. And frankly, you know, what there, for which there was no prospect of any kind of a priori standardization. In fact, it was the basic nature of the internet and things like HTML as a markup language that allowed this, this uh, formation to, to continue to grow and evolve. And that was an important lesson, the idea that you could have uh, essentially a focus on a, a markup language or, or a, way of a machine readable way of describing information as opposed to standardizing on the actual way you stored the information was a transformational capability. And it's been at the heart of how the internet has evolved. And so the industry broadly you know, has generalized that in the form of XML as a base uh, extensible markup language. And from that, many, many sectors in, in various industries have used derivatives of that in order to create a way of describing their own data. Uh, there have been some people in, in parts of the healthcare community that have recognized that evolution and have advocated you know, that something like that should be considered. But by and large, it hasn't uh, gotten a tremendous amount of traction historically, uh, in part because it always gets wrapped up in the same question of how do you deal with the privacy problem uh, and, uh, and the specific interests, commercial and, and institutional, in, in various uh, traditional approaches. Uh, so you know, as we examined this question, uh, we concluded that, uh, in fact, it, it may be possible to use the idea of metadata to describe two things in the health field. One was the provenance of data at a more ele elemental level, and the second was to uh, actually describe the, the constraints on the tertiary, uh, secondary and tertiary uses of data, thereby bringing technology to bear on the question of ultimate uh, disposition and use of information. And so by coupling that with other emerging ideas around digital identity, uh, and high-scale uh, uh, analytical capability, uh, looking at how, for example, indexing systems for the entire internet have, have evolved commercially. It led us to believe that there was uh, the prospect of combining these things in a way that, uh, by and large, had not been pursued, or at least not pursued broadly, in the U.S. health environment. And so. Uh, that, that report ultimately was embraced by the uh, Obama administration and released in December uh, from this uh, advisory body. And uh, the uh, HHS and the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT have embarked on a, uh, an exercise to, uh, through a request for comments and workshops. You know, they really are now trying to examine closely how you could bring, if you will, these, these technologies together to create you know, what I think of in, in, in an overly simplistic way, but as a, a private uh, sort of miniature internet of health-related data, uh, where the clients of this are the healthcare industry exclusively, you know, the, the actual uh, people who have a legitimate need, and where, the, you know, it, it builds a, a much more liquid way of identifying and aggregating data so that you can create a patient-centered view of data, no matter where that data is stored. What's important about this is not just the ability to integrate it, but the idea that a lot of this stuff can be uh, done in, a, in an additive way to the existing healthcare systems. Uh, it would be obviously implausible to, to approach this problem if you said, well, we have a completely new idea, everybody should just throw out all the existing systems. You know, that, that's an intractable way to think about the problem. And so it became very important to, to look uh, around the industry and the healthcare space and broadly within the community of providers of technology in other sectors and, and, and in the internet at large, you know, for proof points that in fact this might be achievable. And at least the committee concluded that it, we thought it was and, and should be pursued. The, 
I think that, that there are a number of uh, interesting uh, opportunities that face you know, this group now. Uh, I think uh, James mentioned recently that um, Kathleen Sebelius and Neely Cruz uh, signed a, a cooperation uh, memorandum of understanding in this field uh, last month, or I guess it was in December. And you know, I think that's an important opportunity for uh, these two uh, uh, continental uh, powers. Each of us faces a challenge in various ways of dealing with the composite problem of access, outcome, quality, and cost, and a need to drive you know, access to be universal, quality to be a lot higher, and cost to be a lot lower. I think that this is not only important for our own societies, but uh, frankly is, is also uh, the basis, ultimately, of finding a more scalable way of using uh, these new technologies uh, to create a lower cost, I'll say more manufacturable, as opposed to trainable uh, uh, health delivery system for the emerging markets. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the world today, it's about six and a half billion people. Uh, arguably only maybe two billion of them have any real high quality health care or even educational capability. And uh, the planet's predicted to get up to about nine billion, maybe nine and a half billion people over the next few decades. And you know, those people are not going to enter at the top of the demographic pyramid. And so, in a sense, we all, I think, have a, 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 certainly a need, if not in some cases, a responsibility and a, even a business opportunity to think carefully about what is the model going to be for addressing uh, this, I'll say, arguably 7 billion more people who really want some higher standard of care uh, and certainly uh, adjunct to that a higher capability in education, but recognize that if we're trying to do it with the cost model and structure that we employ today in the West, it's not likely to be possible. And so I think that you know, finding a way to bind all this knowledge together, to couple that with essentially breakthroughs that may be brought about as we move toward personalized medicine, toward large-scale data-driven uh, both medical practice, diagnostic capabilities, uh, and even uh, more data-driven workflow in the clinical practice. The ability to substitute uh, more decision support software to guide doctors uh, and assist them with this incredible explosion in information. Uh, uh, all of these things, I think, are going to be important, not only in improving our own lot in this area, but in creating a technological underpinning that if packaged up right and coupled with other uh, uh, evolving technologies, for example, like robotics and various forms of telepresence capabilities, you know, may give us a way to contemplate at least taking the bottom of that huge pyramid of people uh, and finding a way to, to dramatically lower the cost of providing the basic care. I, at a personal level, that's something that I think will be important if we want to have a planet that is relatively uh, stable uh, from a sort of a geopolitical standpoint. And, and I think without these basic services being addressed, that's going to be very hard to be assured of. And I think if you just look uh, of the events of last week, for example, the unrest in, in Tunisia, you know, rippling over into Egypt, you know, rippling out of Egypt into Jordan and others, this highly connected world, uh, it, you know, it, is a two-edged sword. You know, as we make all this knowledge and, and uh, give great visibility to, to so many people who today don't know what they've been missing, you know, it, it becomes a great motivator for them to, to say, I want a better environment. If we can't find a way to enable that, then as the disparities grow broader, uh, the unrest becomes more difficult to manage. And of course, the technology becomes an empowering capability, you know, for organizing uh, that unrest. So, you know, I don't think that that we in the West can be sanguine about, you know, living in a in a happy ge geopolitically stable environment, uh, either in economic terms, given the other issues we face, uh, or in in stability of you know, governance terms, if we have the bulk of the the world in a in an unsettled state of mind. 
And I think that you know, these basic almost rights of, of uh, access to education and health care are, are going to be key to doing that. You know, when I think about uh, technology and its evolution, you know, I think personally we're in, a, in an intermediate phase where it's clear that as we try to address these things, we look at uh, a number of, of capabilities related to telemedicine. And I think that while that will be a, an important way to have the most trained people be brought to bear on difficult problems, you know, my personal view is that that can't scale to 7 billion more people. Uh, no matter how good the telecommunications infrastructure is. You know, in a sense, there's just not enough docs. And there's no prospect of having enough docs you know, under the current model, in my view. So somehow we've got to blend together the things that we're learning to do now uh, in, in sort of this telepresent world uh, with more sophisticated capabilities in that domain, but ultimately uh, really, really augmented dramatically by much more advanced technologies. Today, uh, when I look at what Microsoft is doing and where our research is and even some of our recent product capabilities, you know, we're really trying to bring about a change, a very fundamental change in the way people interact with computers and the things that they expect them to do. And in simple terms, you know, I describe this as, a, as sort of an extension beyond uh, GUI or the graphical user interface into NUI, which we call the natural user interface. And, and what that implies is that machines have to get more like us, that we want to interact with them more like they were another person and less like they were a, a, a tool. Uh, and so that this, this evolution of what you expect from the computer, when you can address it and interact with it in some higher order way, it, it's both empowering in terms of the number of people who can be included, uh, at, you know, certainly at a, a lower uh, cognitive load in terms of, of training and using it, but it also creates an environment where the semantic level of, of uh, engagement can be at a higher plane. And so the, the computer moves from what it's been since its inception, which is an increasingly powerful tool, but one which only works at your command, to a system uh, which is more like a helper or an assistant that works on your behalf. And you know, if we can make that leap, then there's a qualitative change available and largely you know, an opportunity from a business and society point of view to have computers help a lot more people at, uh, with a lot more things than they've been able to do in the past. So lurking somewhere uh, behind this change and, and intersected what I call the, you know, the, this super scale, sort of cloud reinforced, uh, highly liquid data environment that we see emergent from the internet. I think you know, I can see the outlines of both a capability to dramatically improve the situation in the healthcare arena, extend that into a world of health and wellness uh, where people are uh, not just monitored in a clinical sense, but ultimately uh, coached and and prodded you know, by, by social networks and, and application programs to, to try to address you know, many of their, their uh, existing or even prospective challenges with a greater focus on prevention and wellness. And I think that as we codify that knowledge and use it to facilitate the practice of medicine even in the, the rich countries, uh, hopefully we'll be doing it with an eye toward how we can package it up and, and at least for a lot of the basic issues around cure and care, uh, provide that conceptually to literally billions of more people in more of a manufactured uh, capacity than one where we have to, to continue to, to train people the way we have in the past. So you could say, you know, I'm not a doctor, you know, and, and oftentimes I've given this kind of speech over the last few years. And you know, frequently, you know, physicians in the audience will stand up and tell me that you know, I don't know what I'm talking about and that you know, they don't understand that you know, medicine is all about laying on hands. And I say, well, that may all be true, and I may be proven wrong. But I will tell you one thing, those other 7 billion people don't have any of you. And so you know, if you're telling me the option is they get nothing or they get a robot you know, who can you know, do some things for them, you know, my guess is many of them will be happy to take the robot. And, uh, and so I, 
you know, while these things are foreign relative to the long evolved way that we've thought about medicine and healthcare, if you look at what's happening in the underpinnings, you know, from system biology to synthetic biology to genomics and proteomics, metabolomics, and, and then the incredible array of sensing and diagnostic capabilities that we have, you know, I think that, that we're at the, the point uh, in this evolution where we should expect a revolution in what is possible. And, and when you intersect all those things in the life sciences space with what will continue to be an incredible uh, continued exponential increase in capabilities of storage, interconnected processing, uh, and even display capabilities in, in computing, you know, I think you have the powerful underpinnings of a, of a revolution in worldwide healthcare. So those are my thoughts. I'll share with you to kick the debate off and uh, look forward to everybody else's comments and questions. Thank you very much.